and Cheryl takes us inside a truly lavish grand villa. In my language, I would call it a very big house. Mmm. Delicious. Good. You, have you ever thought of opening a restaurant? <laughs> no. Anyway, I'm sure you don't want to spend the rest of the evening watching us enjoying this. We'll excuse you to watch Money and see you next week. Tonight, mobile phone addicts, deep in conversation, even deeper in debt. I was shocked, absolutely shocked. Plus, ATM fraud, how you can stay ahead of the scams. And champagne tastes on a beer budget. G'day, I'm Paul Clitheroe and welcome to another week of money. These days, mobile phones are so affordable, even kids are using them. But when the bills start rolling in, they soon realise that talk isn't cheap. Here's Kim Watkins. They're the ultimate cool tool. Hip, groovy, even sexy and seductive. And with deals like this, it's hard to resist. 7.30 for dinner, I'll bring the wine. Bye. Now, whether it's for business or pleasure, Australians love their mobile phones. And one in three 15 to 24 year olds now uses one. But teenagers beware. They may look like a lot of fun, but they're increasingly landing young people in deep financial trouble. When 18-year-old TAFE student Lisa Bates broke into the mobile phone market late last year, she thought she was onto a good thing. Hello? Hey, how are you? With a two-year no, contract, she went on a $10 a month yes, budget plan. But the cheap monthly charge meant the cost of phone calls was very high, something Lisa discovered after a holiday interstate. I started making STD phone calls from Queensland, from the Gold Coast to Sydney. Sort of from then on, I'd use it mostly in daytime as well as nighttime. And it just all added up. A lot of my friends used it as well. So that, <laughs> that ended up really expensive. Ironically, Lisa was on the phone to a friend when her monthly bill arrived, and it wasn't funny. I just sat there for about two minutes just looking at this bill, and my friend's like, hello, hello, and I'm like, um, yeah, I'm still here. She goes, what's the matter? I said, I just opened my phone bill. She goes, how much was it? I said, like $365. <laughs> it got worse. The next month, Lisa racked up another $224 bill, leaving her $590 in the red. If you could call it stunned, it was, that's probably about an understatement, I'd have to say. Very, I was shocked, absolutely shocked. Alyssa Fuller is also learning the hard way. At just 18, she's desperately hoping legal aid can get her out of serious strife. So the amount that they're now taking you to court for uh, on this contract is $1,600, which uh, I suppose you're surprised it's gone up that quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Alyssa made the fatal but common mistake of signing a mobile phone contract for a younger friend. Scott agreed to give me money every month, which he didn't yeah. stick to. But... <laughs> With her name on the contract, Alyssa is legally liable for the debt. And because she couldn't afford to pay the $500 bill, the phone has been disconnected with all sorts of extra fees. And that's how it quickly soared to the $1,600 mark. Alyssa is being sued to recover the debt and her credit rating is shot. Customer service may have a car service to register one, please. While Alyssa's fighting it out in court, Lisa Bates has paid off her hefty phone bill. With extra work shifts, a loan from her mum and a three-week extension on her bill, she's back in the black. Better still, she's radically changed her phone habits. I cut down a lot from uh, change my plan. Um, I don't let my friends use it. I usually use it after 7pm, which is cheap. And I also got a call bar put on it, so I can only call local calls and certain mobiles. Lisa's now a good example of how mobile phones can be used sensibly and cost effectively. It's a question of discipline. So here are a few tips to keep your calls under control. Choose some of the new prepaid services so you know exactly what you're spending. Read the contract carefully before you sign. They're extremely difficult and costly to break. Avoid expensive extras like diversions, call waiting and message bank don't sign a contract for someone else, you're liable for all the charges. 
put a secret code into your phone so others can't use it and keep your calls short. And don't forget, it's always much cheaper to use a payphone. Yeah, hi. Would you like me to bring white or red wine? Both. OK, bye. Paul Clithrow shares property, it's all there. Visit the show and bring your collectibles to the Sotheby's Appraisal Day. The Money Show exhibition starts Friday at Homebush Bay. Money, money. No matter where you are in the world, getting cash from a hole in the wall has become a way of life. Now, you may not realise this, but the first ATM was introduced into Australia back in 1979. That was 20 years ago. But as we've constantly been warning you on money, all of this convenience doesn't come without a price. And that's why we're here in Miami, because in America, ATM fraud has become a big business, and we want to keep you one step in front of the crooks. This scam is called card trapping. You can't get your card out of the ATM, but guess who can? The most I made in a day was 1500 Guy Lamarkovitz was the card trapping king. He's now serving an 11-month jail term. And it only takes like a minute and a half to do it, you know. It's in a half an hour, you can have $600 in your, your pocket. And this is how it's done. Markovitz himself caught on tape. First, he disables the card insert slot, squirting in a substance police have asked us not to reveal. Once he sets the trap, he waits. Enter Joe Doherty, who puts his card in, but can't get it back. It just sort of ground to a halt as it was going in. Markovitz then comes back, acting like he's waiting his turn. Earlier, he'd attached an official-looking note to the ATM saying, if for any technical reason your card is retained, dial your PIN number three times and then press Enter. When Joe Doherty does this, our crook's got everything he needs. You know, you don't have to see the number. You have to see where he press. You know, I can, I can do like 10 feet away. When Joe eventually leaves, Markovitz uses a pair of pliers to pull the card out. Then, wearing a cap to hide his face, he starts emptying out Joe's account. They took $750. Within two hours, they had all that money out. I'm sure he had a good time. <laughs> One of the other swindles over here is a lot more sophisticated. It starts at a service station or a car wash, and it's netted one American gang nearly $3 million. David Sweetman lost the lot soon after he paid by FPOS for a car wash. It was a little over $6,600 out of checking and savings. They, they emptied all my accounts. It worked like this. Employees were paid off to secretly hook up laptop computers to the business's FPOS machines. When your card was swiped, all your account information was also recorded on the laptop. But it didn't stop there. Hidden cameras were placed directly over the keypad. As PIN numbers were entered, it was all recorded and later matched up with the info skimmed into the laptop. Then for the money itself. And here the gang had to copy the captured information onto the magnetic strip of a dummy ATM card. Now that sounds pretty challenging. But as I found out, not in the high-tech age that we live in. Once you have the equipment, it's no problem. This US Secret Service agent is still working undercover, so we can't reveal his identity. The equipment is sophisticated, but the crime is simple. And this is how it's done. In a matter of seconds, all that recorded magnetic strip information duplicated on a dummy card. I have a card copying program running right now. Swipe it through the card reader writer. Your, your card information, what's on this magnetic strip, is right here on the screen. OK, so you've copied that into here. This computer knows everything that's on your credit card right everything. now. Everything. OK, all right, here's this one, then what? Take your counterfeit card. Yep. Swipe it. Write OK. That OK means my account's ready to be KO'd by the crooks. Everything on my original card copied onto the fake one. So, basically, it's a claim. Exactly. So I could be out shopping with my card and 
You could be out shopping with my card. They could get very expensive. Very. OK, now for the big test. I've got the card the information's been transferred onto. So let's pop it into this machine and press this. Oh, you know, you might have a look at this. Withdrawal. We've got $100. Oh, we have action. I think the man has done the job. And, somewhat to my amazement, I've got $100, and I think the machine is even going to give me a receipt. The newest scam in the US is to do with cards as well, this time credit cards. It's been happening in restaurants, and once again crooks are using technology to rip you off. The waiter takes your card innocently, he charges your meal, and then he swipes your card through the device. That device records your number. Later on, that device is downloaded, and those card numbers are re-encoded onto counterfeit credit cards. In one case being investigated, just one waiter is believed to have stolen close to $4 million. So what can we do back here to protect ourselves? Well, with our credit cards, unfortunately, not a lot except to keep an even closer eye on our statements and to make sure we report any discrepancies immediately. But with our key cards, there is a simple way not to get caught out. Simply do as I did in Miami and cover up your hand any time you're using your PIN number. That way, even if the crooks do copy your card, there's no way they can go out and use it. This is a prized possession from our colonial past, a portrait miniature connected with the family of William Cox, the man famous for building the road over the Blue Mountains in New South Wales in 1814. I'm a great, 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 great granddaughter of William Cox. It's painted on ivory, and like many miniatures, the back is decorated with hair from the subject. The mystery is, just who is he? Depending on which family member it is, um, that's going to determine the value. What is known is that because of its high quality, it's worth up to $10,000. If further investigations reveal it's a prominent member of the Cox family, that value could double. The main medium is watercolours. This piece was brought in by the same well-connected family, a self-portrait by famous Australian artist Bessie Gibson. She was uh, an aunt, wasn't she? An aunt, an aunt. my grandmother. Aunt. It was probably painted in the 1920s when Bessie was in her 50s and has a value of up to $6,000. This dot painting should be familiar to most of us. It's by David Malangi, the most celebrated living Aboriginal artist, whose similar designs were used in our old $1 note. This one looks particularly nice though. It looks like it dates from the late 60s or the early 70s. It's in excellent condition as well. It's valued at up to $5,000. And as the owner explains, it's about to go up for sale. Because the wife doesn't like it. And we never hang it. It just sits in the cupboard. This Albert Namajira watercolour was given as a present to an Adelaide family 15 years ago. Yeah, a white ghost gum in the, in the Western uh, McDonnell Ranges where he painted. It's from a very, very good period of his work uh, from the 1940s. Because it's been kept in excellent condition, it's worth up to $15,000. This called on all of Sotheby's expertise. I think it's Spanish. It's thought to be a banner carried during Easter pageants in the mid-1800s. It's valued at up to $1,000. Not bad, considering how much it cost. <laughs> yeah, $1.50, yeah. For income, $1.50. You don't know the artist. Yeah. This painting's been handed down through generations. It's a portrait of this woman's great, great, great grandmother. Well, I believe she was a French model. Right. It's from the 1830s, but its value is difficult to calculate because the artist isn't known. It will be sold, though. Not only are there no more family members to pass it on to, but finding a suitable place to hang it has also been a problem. I tried to hang it in the bedroom once, and one of my friends said, I'm not, I'm not making love to you in front of your family. <laughs> Interesting to find out where the next buyer hangs it. Kelly Sloan, the reporter there. Now, don't forget, our big Sydney Sotheby's Day is coming up very soon.
It's all part of our money show being held at the Sydney Showground and Exhibition Complex beginning this Friday. You'll find out all you need to know about investing from Australia's top experts. There'll be displays, new products and free seminars twice a day from yours truly. Then during the show on Sunday, our antique appraisal experts from Sotheby's will be there to give you their thoughts on your treasures. That's all starting this Friday. I hope to see you there. Most of us assume it's cheaper to buy bulk. After all, it makes sense that the bigger the package, the bigger the savings. Well, that can be a big mistake. It might surprise you to learn that with some of the most popular items in the supermarket, you'll actually be better off buying the smaller package. Take this margarine, for instance. While prices may vary from week to week, today it's cheaper to buy the smaller one. The same goes for this cat food. And there are big savings to be made on small packages of nappies. Why? Well, it's because these sizes are more popular with shoppers. The manufacturer has a higher turnover and can bring the prices down. The tricky part is figuring out when to buy big and when to buy small. And it doesn't help when you're faced with this kind of thing. A 90 gram tube of toothpaste at $1.97 or 120 grams at $3.14. How on earth do you figure that one out? very difficult. You really need a calculator to go through all of the prices, all of the sizes of product, and they vary enormously, to come out with really what is the cheapest product that you want to buy. Well, there is a simple solution, and it's called unit pricing. It's not available in Australia, but if it was, it'd make shopping a breeze. Unit pricing basically does the sums for you. Next to every price on the shelf will be a sticker telling you how much you're paying per unit. For instance, with soft drinks, you'd get a price per 100 mils. With canned goods, a price per 100 grams. And with toilet paper, a price per roll. Sounds like a lot of work for the supermarket, but the system has been a success in the UK and US for years. Unit pricing would solve the toothpaste dilemma. We'd know at a glance that the smaller package was actually better value for money than the larger package. And in fact, 51 cents better value for money. I really think that it is an issue that uh, um, is popular amongst uh, some people, but is really just not an issue uh, amongst most of the supermarket customers. Bruce Bevan from the Australian Supermarket Institute admits though that the system can be difficult for shoppers. It's even confusing to me, my math is not great, but uh, I think uh, most uh, regular shoppers uh, work out pretty quickly what's good value for money. But ask customers what they think about unit pricing. Well, now that's a good idea. You like that yeah, idea? That's a good idea. Makes it simple. If it's there in front of you, you can see quickly which one's cheapest. To lobby for change, contact the Department of Fair Trading or its equivalent in your state or territory. Put some effort behind what is going to be a revelation for you in the way that you shop. If you're after a luxury lifestyle but you haven't got the money to match it, then you should take the lead from a group of folk here in London have come up with a way to enjoy the high-flying lifestyle without breaking the bank. This would have to be one of the world's best-filled garages, but the cars in here aren't owned by one person. They're part of the ultimate carpool, the brainchild of London lawyer David Kavanagh. When I was a barrister, if uh, my clerks or anyone in chambers phoned up to find me, they'd always say, oh, he's the guy squirrelled away somewhere in a corner with a classic car magazine. So even then, it was, it was really my, my passion and my love. In 1995, David hung up his wig and gown to start the Classic Car Club, a car lovers cooperative where members pay the equivalent of 5,000 Aussie dollars a year to drive classic cars. And you get access to some of the world's most wanted wheels. The club's car collection is valued at around 1.3 million Australian dollars and members get to drive a range of cars from this Lamborghini Jalpa to BMWs, Mercedes or even a Porsche. This is how it works. Each year members start with a pool of points. Every time they take a car out, points are deducted. How many depends upon the time of year, day of the week and the type of car. But on average members can expect to hit the road about 50 times a year. Boys toys. I mean, this is the best thing in the world. 
When he's not starring in the British television drama The Lakes, Charles Dale can't wait to get behind the wheel. His favourite is this 1998 Caterham 7 convertible. If I win the lottery, I will have a warehouse full of 60 classic cars. But until I do that, I'm not going to be able to afford it. So in the meantime, you know, I just pay my money here and you've got like 60 cars you can just go out and play with. It's great. There are plenty of other advantages too, like no car washing or cleaning to be done, no repair bills and no insurance premiums. It's all a matter of having your fun, then handing the car back. When you consider what you pay here to drive all these cars and what it would cost you to keep one of those on the road, especially in London, it's great value for money, yeah. The Classic Car Club already has more than 300 members and organisers are now getting ready to tackle the new car market as well with plans for another co-op which will give members access to new release cars. And if this all sounds like you, then you'll be pleased to hear that the club has plans to open in Sydney later this year. They hope to be up and running in time for our summer, so perhaps a membership may make the perfect Christmas present for your closet rev head. Well, that's something to look forward to, and that just about wraps up the show for this week. But before we go, a reminder that following our story on private mortgages last week, I'll be hosting a public forum on the Gold Coast next week. It's being held at the Southport RSL starting at 7.30 next Thursday, the 22nd of July. And you need to ring this number to register so we can guarantee you a seat. That's 1902 211 911. Now let's have a look at what's on money next week. Cooking legend Margaret Fulton talks exclusively about her close call with bankruptcy. Yes, my home was worth fighting for, but also I felt a tiny bit of the injustice of, mm. and how wrong it was that this could happen. That's 8 o'clock next Wednesday. I'll see you then. Good night. International air travel provided by KLM, operating from Australia to over 100 European destinations. KLM, the reliable airline.